everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Board Games and Stuff. Now, I've wanted to do this uh, video on cooperative games for a while now, ever since Miami Vice did the video back uh, with Tom, Z, and Sam about their favorite cooperative games. And there was really a lot off of their list that I enjoyed, so I wanted to kind of uh, do sort of a follow up to that video of talking about some games of my own. Now, of course, some of the ones that you mentioned were also some of my favorites. I'm not going to go back over those. I'm going to pick ten different ones in no particular order that are different from what they talked about in that episode. I'll put the link uh, maybe in the first comment below and right here on the screen. If you want to jot it down real quick, you can go and uh, check out that video first or after this one. And you'll see that they have some really good co-op games on there as well if you haven't seen that. I really enjoy co-op games. They are probably one of my favorite uh, types of genres of games, mainly for the fact that they're just so accessible. Now, we have a couple core heavy game groups, and most of the time that's when I can get my confrontational games and you know head-to-head -head games in with that group. But half the time we usually find ourselves playing with either new couples, or maybe we're visiting a couple family members, and you don't necessarily want to jump into a, a, some sort of party game, but you want to introduce them to something new. And I really find that co-op games are the best way for not only just kind of bridging a gap to introduce the new people, but it's just it's so much more of a, a comfortable experience around the table with people that might not be quite as familiar with games. It's also great with my, uh, my daughter, who's almost turning 10, that she's sort of gravitating to a little bit more difficult games. It's easier to introduce her to co-op games as well that have a little more of a rule set. So we're not jumping right into something with a lot of rules and complications where, you know, I'm going to have a distinct advantage over her or I'm going to have to let her win. This way she can really make her own decisions with my help and, and get through the process of the game. I think co-op is almost a perfect number for when you have four, five, or six players and you're not looking for you know, that uh, that head-to-head -head or that competition aspect of the night, and you just want something that, that everyone can kind of rally around, and, and everyone's upset when you lose, but everyone's excited when you win, so there's really no one that can kind of feel left out. And we do have some friends that are, have a bit of a difficult time losing, so a lot of times, I'll, I'll if we're not playing team games or something like that, uh, co-op games are usually the best bet when dealing with people like that as well. All right, so enough with the little rambling. Let's uh, let's jump in. I'm going to show you some games. I'm going to start off with a couple of games that are fantasy themed as well as co-op because fantasy is also one of my favorite themes in the game. Co-op is one of my favorite genres, so the two really kind of uh, combine very well. So I'm going to show you a couple of games in that genre first. Let's take a look at some. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this one here, Legends of Andor. In fact, this was the last video I did, the last episode of Board Games and stuff. I did a complete overall sort of breakdown video, rule explanation, and gave you my thoughts on what this game's all about. But it is a great fantasy-themed co-op adventure-style game. Uh, this game actually has a lot of storytelling elements to it, where you're pretty much working your way through the story more than just kind of randomly running around and doing certain things in the game. You're, there are definitely goals and aspects of things that you're trying to uh, trying to accomplish. So that's really all I'm going to say about Legends of Andor. Go back, check out the other video, and uh, let's take a look at another one. Okay, here we have the Dungeons and Dragons adventure style board games. These have uh, been out for a couple of years now. There's actually three different ones. There's uh, Well, the, the most recent one is The Legend of Drist. If you're not familiar with Drist, he is a very popular drow character in the uh, Dungeons & Dragons universe. He, he uh, is a good guy, so this is all about him and uh, his crew and everything. And then the first one was actually called uh, Ravenloft, Castle Ravenloft. That was the first one to come out and sort of introduced you to the system. And then there was a middle one called Wrath of a Shardalon, which I didn't pick up. Uh, these two are pretty much, I think, enough for me. I've, uh, I've actually completely painted my sets uh, and I really enjoy the game. In this game, the players are going to be playing a group of heroes and you're going to be randomly laying out tiles each turn and sort of building the dungeon and you're going to be headed towards your overall goal, which is normally just killing a, a big bad guy. The, the Legend of Drist actually has a little bit more scenarios in there. There's actually a team versus team scenario and a couple of different things that you're trying to accomplish. But for the most part, you're trying to, to get in and, and take care of uh, 
a main baddie as it is. On a player's turn, most of the time you're going to be laying these tiles out forming the maps, and then different monsters are going to be spawning, and the game has a way of controlling the monsters for you. You'll also be collecting items and equipment, and you, there's even a possibly ways that you can level up your character in this game as well. These were really one of the first co-op dungeon crawl games that, that I got, so that's why probably why I got really heavily into them and why I enjoyed them the most. The tiles could be a little bit better if you've ever played The Scent. The Scent has some really nice looking tiles. These are pretty plain and basic. They do serve their purpose. Since I have all the, uh, the creatures and, and the characters painted, it sort of pops out on the table a little bit more than just the, uh, the plain tiles with the, the gray and, and blue and yellow creatures. So, Actually, there's no yellow. They're green. Doesn't really matter. Let's move on. All right, well, we got to stick to uh, the fantasy-themed dungeon crawl cooperative game here. Uh, this game is actually a lot like uh, the, the last game I just discussed. You're sort of laying down tiles and you're working your way through it. The reason I did this one third is because it's a little bit of a mixture of the past two games that I just showed you. It's got a lot of storytelling aspects where you're reading out of a book and you're progressing along as you read the story, but then it also is a lot like the last game, the, the, <laughs> the Dungeons and Dragons games, where you're going through the tiles and monsters are coming up on them and the game is, is uh, controlling those monsters for you. The theme of this one is that you've all been transformed into mice and all the guards have been transformed into crazy little creatures like centipedes and rats and cockroaches and you're fighting your way through. It's really uh, a nice little game. It is something that can be played with uh, children. It's a very good introductory game, maybe that next step for like an eight seven, eight, nine, ten year old, but it's, it's there's plenty in this game for adults as well. It's not just for kids. Uh, I'm actually just finished painting uh, the character miniatures for this one as well. The artwork on the tiles is fantastic. In fact, all the artwork in the game is really well done. So if you like the dungeon crawl theme and you want something a little bit different, check out Mice and Mystics. All right, so staying with Fantasy Co-op, but moving away from the Dungeon Crawl into just a straight-up card game. And that's my favorite cooperative two-player card game. can be played with four, but it's really a two-player game. And it's part of Fantasy Flight's Living Card Game line. Now, I'm not really big in the Living Card Games as far as... I own a couple of them, but I don't get into the, the deck-building aspect of the game. I've picked up a couple of smaller box expansions for this one, and I just sort of, like, picked some of the cards that I liked and, and slid them into the deck. You don't need to be into that to really get into this game. I just like keeping it simple, keeping the base game with a couple extra cards. And again, it's just, this is a really fun two-player co-op card game. And, and that situation arises a lot where you're playing with another player and you, again, it might be a new player and you just don't, really don't want to get into it head to head. This is when it really comes into play. It's a little more complex, but once you've played it a few times, it, it, it gets a lot easier to teach. And usually after the first round or so, the other player kind of knows what's going on, and, and with it being cooperative, of course, you can you can help them out a little bit. And uh, there's a good range of difficulty where the first couple missions are, are, are slightly simpler, but they can get incredibly hard, that's for sure. So if you want a challenge, uh, nothing wrong with uh, bumping this one up a couple notches and, and giving it a shot. Okay, so I might as well finish out my first five of my ten in the fantasy theme and this one here is called Castle Panic. This one is way different than the, than the other ones I showed you though however. In Castle Panic you're basically it's sort of a, a, a tower defense system style game where you're all you have a hand of a couple of cards that allow you to make attacks and the board is this basically a castle in the center of the board surrounded by these different rings of locations where the creatures are going to constantly be coming towards you closer and closer, and the object of the game is to, is to defend them off by playing these cards that do damage to the creatures as you move along. This is a great family-style game. It's real easy to, to teach and learn, and I believe it says 10 and up, but I feel that you could probably play this easily with 6 and up. You know, just kind of a little help here and there. It's a very simple game. In fact, um, I don't think I ever lost about the first 10 or 12 times I played it. However, they did put out an expansion called the Wizard's Tower. It adds uh, some more really cool cards to the game. And it also adds this cool Wizard's Tower in the center of the board that you're trying to protect as well. 
And if you're looking to bump up the difficulty on this one, that is the way to do it. I've only won once out of about five or six times playing with the uh, the New Wizards Tower expansion, but it's still a lot of fun, easy to get into. You can't go wrong uh, on a family game night with uh, with this one, Castle Panic. Well, if you listen to Not Just Another Gaming Podcast, you've heard us talk about this puppy quite a bit the past couple of episodes. That's Zombicide. This game is is pretty much like a dungeon crawler, but it's with zombies and you're out in the street. But you, uh, the board is usually already set up before you get going, sort of like it is in Mice and Mystics, and you're not revealing new tiles, but you are walk going through the city, usually trying to accomplish some sort of mission, which may just be getting to a certain location, or opening a certain door, rescuing someone. There's, there's really 20 or 30 different scenarios, especially if you go on uh, Board Game Geek or Cool Mini or Not's website, and download some free ones that they have for, on it for there. I've also painted this entire set, and I uh, just really enjoy it. They're, your characters have a uh, leveling up ability as you're going through the game. You're earning experience points and, and, and gaining new abilities. And, of course, the, the different types of zombies really come into play here. And you're searching and looting and trying to find better weapons to help yourself out as well. If you like zombies... And you think there's just way too many zombie games out there? Well, this is the one to get right here. If you have none, this is the one to get. Zombie side. Escape! Curse of the Temple is a cooperative dice rolling frenzy of a game. And this game, again, it's, it's not quite a dungeon, it's actually a temple. And you'll be flipping up tiles, making the pathway where you're trying to escape. You're starting in the center of the temple. And you need to get to the end by frantically, just everyone at the same time is rolling dice. And they're trying to roll the correct combinations to move themselves from one tile to the other. While trying to activate these, um, these gems. Because in order to get out of the temple, when you finally find the exit, you've got to be able to roll a certain amount of keys. Which has to do with how many gems are left. So you need to get all these gems activated before you even have a chance to get out. If you haven't heard much about this game, one of the intuitive aspects of this game is that it comes with a 10-minute soundtrack, and the whole game is played during the course of this soundtrack. At two points in the soundtrack, there's a gong, and you have to rush back to the center of the thing. Because if you don't, you're going to lose one of your five dice, and then you're down to four dice. And if that happens twice, you're only rolling three dice. It's not very simple to do. It is co-op, but you are kind of doing your own thing a lot of the times, but there's also some, some gem altars that you can only activate with uh, a couple of people in the same room, and you can also, when you're in the same room with someone, you can also share uh, dice in certain ways, and then when you escape the temple, you can trade off dice as well. So, it's, uh, it's, it's hectic. Uh, plan on running out of breath during this game, and it uh, might not be one if you're playing with uh, somebody that just likes it, wants a nice relaxing game, because this one can uh, this one can put you on the edge, that's for sure. Escape Curse of the Temple. Alright, I'm going to show you these next two games together. These games actually are part of Fantasy Flight's Silver Line box game, although Red November did come out with an expanded, larger uh, box that you can pick up. I'm not even sure if this uh, this version of it is, is still, still available, but both of these games are, are often overlooked. And I think they're really fantastic cooperative games and extremely difficult. First talk about Red November here. In this game, you're actually on a submarine that is sinking. And all kinds of stuff is going wrong. Fires are coming up. Uh, the sub's starting to leak and the systems are failing. And your characters are all actually all little gnomes, which is, which is kind of silly there that are uh, on this submarine. And when you take actions, there's sort of this time track around the outside of the board... And the longer you do to take an action, the easier it might become, but this time system is the whole thing that's making uh, things happen on the ship. So the longer you're taking to do something, more th bad things are coming up. And the object is basically to survive until you get around to the end of this, this time track. It's really a lot of fun, and, and it's one of the cooperative games that I have that can play up to eight players. So it's easy to pull this one out with a big crowd that may not be so much into a, a party game of sorts. You can you can pull this one out, and if you have the small version, it does not take up much room on the table whatsoever. So uh, that's Red November. You might want to check this one out if you have it. Now we're going to uh, take a look at the Space Hulk Deck Angel card. I was a little hesitant to pick this one up because I'm not too much into the whole uh, Space Hulk theme from Fantasy Flight, and I don't know a lot of background about it. In this one, you're actually playing 
um, a squad of different space marines, and you're sort of uh, venturing into the, through this uh, uh, or space station, mate, possibly, and uh, you sort of got to use your teamwork and. Your characters are actually on these cards, and they have certain types of attacks. Uh, they have to move around the, the area that they're in. Of course, these gene stealers are coming out trying to attack you as well. In the game, you're trying to reach the final location card uh, that's in a deck, and that'll have a winning condition listed on that. You can also win if you've killed all these uh, gene stealers. And there's also like these blip piles that I'm not going to go too much into, but uh, you f fulfill one of those conditions, and, and all players win or lose the game. This is kind of one of those games where someone is over and I say, hey, you want to check out this Death Angel uh, card game? They're sort of like, I don't know. They, don't, they, they look at this tiny box and they, they see that it's card games and they, they don't think there's going to be much to it. But we get it out and we, we play it and it, it, it always gets that reaction of, wow, that, that was a lot more fun than I, I thought it was going to be. So it can go overlooked and, it, and it's, you know, again, nice small compact package, uh, easy to take somewhere with you. And I uh, can can handle one to six players, so uh, if you're finding yourself wanting to sit down and play it solo, which I, this is one of the few here that I have played solo, it's uh, it's pretty good. So check check this one out. All right, so for my tenth one, I kind of wanted to throw a throw a conkly, uh All right, so for my tenth one, I kind of wanted to throw kind of a strange one in there, and this one technically isn't cooperative. You are all working together, but the game does say that the the person who who well, hold on, let me just tell you about the game first. Uh, it's not an easy game to find, but uh, as you can see there, I found it in a thrift store for $1. So uh, you, can't, you can't go wrong with that. And it's one of my better thrift store finds. This game, uh, let me just show you this. This game comes with this plastic tower. And you want to actually play it with not a lot of lighting on uh, whatsoever. Because when you turn the tower on... I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I can find some other video. It's actually a blue lighting. Now the pieces in the game of the bad players are like the wolves and some of the, the townsfolk. They look completely fine during the day. But they're sort of this 3D kind of blue on red. What happens when uh, you, you press this thing and the nighttime comes, the cards and the spaces on the board even change into a more dreadful spot. So you might be on a space that looks safe, but when nighttime comes, that space actually turns and it might now be a trap and the villagers now turn into werewolves. It's a really cool, uh, a little fun game to bust out and play with. And of course, one of the ways that uh, there's an overall winner is when you get to the final baddie, it has to determine with who it's either the final blow uh, is the overall winner, but of course you, you can just play it cooperative and you can kind of ignore that rule of whoever gets the final blow is, is the main winner of the game. Kind of hard to track down. Might be able to find it on Amazon or, or eBay or something like that. Pretty cheap, but uh, it's a fun little co-op game to pull out. And it's great, great with kids. They definitely love this one. Vampire Hunter. Alright, so there you go. There's uh, ten more cooperative games for your uh, that you want to check out if you're, you're into cooperative games. And maybe there's a couple in there you haven't heard of. That's good. Another good aspect, obviously, of cooperative games is the fact that you can pretty much play any of them by yourself. You can just... Most of them do have rules to where you can play one player. Or if they don't have specific rules, it's easy enough to just set up the game and you, you know, kind of control all the heroes yourself and play it that way. I don't really do that very often. Most of the time, if I'm by myself, usually I'll just find myself, you know, working on a video or, or working on the podcast or something like that. But uh, if, you, if you're into playing games solo, the, you, you pretty much can't go wrong with any of the ten that I just showed you there. Maybe Vampire Hunters would be a little strange sitting around the dark room by yourself playing that one with some eerie music going on. But hey, if that's your thing, hey, go for it. So uh, thanks for watching another episode of Board Games and Stuff, and uh, I'll see you back here really soon this time, I promise. Thanks for watching our review today. For more information about board games, as well as the number one board game audio podcast, check out Dicetower.com for reviews, interviews, and more. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. <laughs>